Hello, my lovely peaches. Welcome and welcome back. Today's video, I am going to be discussing Go F Yourself Karen Reed Trial Day 16, which was yesterday, Wednesday, May 22nd, 2024. It is currently Thursday, May 23rd, and it's 3.36 p.m. at the moment. I'm filming this Eastern Standard Time. What I'm really planning to do for this video is to screen record some of yesterday's testimony that I didn't capture in the video I posted um, today. So last night at like midnight to 2 a.m. I screen recorded some of Jen McCabe's final testimony, the third day for her, and then I screen recorded some of Carrie Roberts' testimony, but the video got long, it got super late, and I was like, okay, I have to leave it here. So I wanted to go back to finish talking about yesterday, Cameron Reed trial day 16. And I also wanted to screen record some more of Carrie Roberts testimony, as well as the Sullivan sisters, where they discussed an argument in Aruba. And there was some testimony. I talked about it yesterday or I should say today. So if you wanna go back and see the background of the Sullivan sisters and all that, then you can go watch yesterday's video. But in order to keep this not, you know, two hours and hopefully, which it might be, cause I don't know how long the testimony is, but then the defense did not cross examine Carrie Roberts. So it, it was brief. And then the two sisters testimony was pretty brief. And I'm planning not to capture the entire thing of what they testified to, but just the super relevant parts that I wanted to point out. So I may pop in and do some commentary in between or after. And I have a couple of notes that I wanted to point out that I wrote down when I was listening to this section of Carrie Roberts testimony that I recorded. So I saw that one of the lawyers that I listened to had commented that they think it's weird that the judge Beverly Canoni frequently says, you know, take to take exhibits down. And she feels like, uh, or that lawyer said they feel like maybe, um, you know, she doesn't want evidence up there kind of like she's corrupt or whatever or biased but then I noticed that today prosecutor Lolly had a video up there and she said it to him do you want to keep it on the screen or take it down and he was like leave it up for now so I wanted to just point that out that she was doing it to the prosecutor too so I felt like it's not necessarily a bias against the defense and then also Natalie lawyer chick had pointed out that she noticed that when there's an objection so she was she noticed and she said maybe when there's an objection when the defense is objecting she'll say sustained or overruled but then when prosecutor Lolly is objecting Natalie observed that she thinks it might be that and and I did notice that judge Canoni often will instead of saying sustained she'll say he can have that i'll let him have it or she'll just directly say to the witness can you answer that and then instead of saying overruled she'll just say you know move on so she natalie was pointing out it seems almost like it's a soft a soft ruling for the prosecutor you know and prosecutor instead of saying overruled she'll just be like okay let it go so I was trying to notice if she, if the judge is doing that, you know, like, is it clear bias or is she just kind of doing it random? So I feel like it's, it wasn't so, so clear bias. It seems like it's kind of maybe a little bit random and she might do it a little bit on each side. So let's see. Then also somebody had pointed out that, and I think it might have been defense attorney Bob Mata, which I realized it's like, I was like, he seems so on the defense side. It's like, oh, well, he's a defense attorney. So of course he's going to more likely lean in that way of looking at things because that's his lifestyle. Just like, or I mean, that's his, you know, that's his training. 
just like Emily D. Baker was a prosecutor, and I feel that often she looks at things more like from a prosecutor perspective, although in this case, I think she actually hates Prosecutor Lolly. So, so she's not really, she's like, ah! All right, but so anyway, someone had pointed out that Jen testified that it was Karen who was insisting on the going back to 34 Fairview. Carrie testified that Jen and Karen wanted to go back to 34 Fairview. I'm reading. And then Prosecutor Lolly said, um, was that something the witness was, the, the defendant was saying? And then she said that when they were, when they were first on the phone, when Carrie was in her car and she was on the phone with them on Bluetooth so she could hear what they were saying, Jen and Karen in Karen's SUV, she said, Karen said, I left him at the waterfall, the bar and grill. And then Jen said, I saw you pull up at my sister's house. And so that's when they were like, we have to go back there. So I just wanted to point that out. Then also Carrie Roberts testified that John's phone was found underneath his back. He was laying on his back, face up, and that when they moved him, the EMTs, not her, when they moved his body, she saw that his phone had been underneath his back and that there was grass on the ground and that everything else was covered in snow, but underneath him and his phone grass so those were some of the things I wanted to point out I also want to just mention that I play most of this on 1.25 speed some of it is 1.5 speed there are a few clips where it's 1.75 speed but that was like a little too fast and then as I was screen recording it there were a few times like I got some texts from various people so I had to like cut that out and then go back a little. So there might be a few moments where it's like, it feels like it went like, it glitched back. And that's because I had to delete that little section and then go back. So if you see those little like, boop, oops, that's the reason for that. And now I'm going to go ahead and screen record the rest of her testimony that I think was relevant. And then the parts of the Sullivan sisters whose first names I need to remember. Okay, it was Laura and Marietta Sullivan. Those were, so Laura's the older sister, Sullivan, Marietta's the younger sister, and they testified about a trip to Aruba that they took with John O'Keefe and Karen Reed yesterday. So I'm gonna screen record just the super relevant parts of that testimony. Again, I am screen recording this from Law and Crime on YouTube. The whole entire testimony from yesterday is there. It's about over two hours if you want to go watch it in full. Okay, and now enjoy the video. Step outside. <laughs> Let me go across the street. Dang, some motherfucker just made an illegal left and came out all unnecessarily aggressive. People are so, such dicks. Anyway, okay, so let me check my notes. Oh, so there was a part where in yesterday's video, I said that Karen had paid for the dinner. She paid the bill and I thought that it was for the whole like 40, the group of 40, but actually Laura said it was, it was for a different dinner. So there were still quite a few people there, not 40, maybe it was like six or something. But so she said that Karen went and paid the bill before the bill was given. And then the entire table was taken aback. And they were like, they wanted a Venmo, they, you know. So that was that. Then she, Karen said, that she was honored to be there and wanted to pay for it. Let that damn plane go by. All right, and then some notes I had made going back to Carrie Roberts' testimony that, um, so this was in around the five hour mark on the uh, law and crime video. 
she said that Karen had said she was going to kill herself if he was dead, if John was dead. And then Carrie Roberts cried about the blood on her hands. She got to the hospital. She had to go clean up. And Lolly said, what did, why did you need to clean up? And she said she still had his blood on her hands. She went to the chapel. And um, so then in Aruba, Chloe was watching the kids, which I thought was kind of funny because Chloe was the dog that, that was rehomed. But uh, there was also a Chloe in Aruba watching the kids. Okay, so the names of the, of the sisters was Laura was the older sister. And then the younger sister was Marietta. And um, funny, I used to have a relative named Marietta. I say used to because it's like my cousin or somebody who was married to a Marietta and then they got divorced. So, or no, that was somebody else. No, that's actually a different name. No, I don't think Marietta got divorced. Anyway, let's see. So what other notes did I say that... Um, Okay, so I was a little confused also last night about who exactly said what in Aruba. And um, I, I think I might have said that Karen said, Karen said to Laura, uh, your sister was making out with John. But actually, Laura said that John, when, when he wasn't showing up to the cabana, she was like... Um, are you coming? We got you the cabana. If you don't want it, I can sell it to another couple, you know, so he didn't lose out the money. And then he was like, who's all there? And uh, she said, everybody. And then he texted, apparently I made out with your sister the other night. So that's when she asked her sister, did you make out with John? And she said, absolutely not. So Lolly's like, why wouldn't you? And she's like, he was like my big brother. Okay. And then she also said that his name was screamed across the lobby very loudly. Oh, this is, uh, yeah, Marietta. John's name was screamed across the lobby very loudly, very angrily. And then she heard, who the fuck was that? And then he said, calm down, that's Laura's little sister. So then she went around the corner, saw, saw them, said, hi, nice to meet you. Karen said, go fuck yourself. And then she said, yeah, fuck you too. And that Karen was waving her arms and was animated. So... Those are the things I wanted to point out about yesterday's testimony. Does that mean that Karen did it? No. It does go to show possibly her character and the nature of their relationship and the nature of her potential jealousy. There's probably shit over here. I just realized because <laughs> there's a poop terrace on the street. I said in another video that... Um, Someone claiming that you're like super jealous when they in fact are cheating on you or they are kissing and find them making out that if somebody's actually cheating on you, you see them making out with someone, you know that they did that, then you're not actually like hysterical. You're not unhinged. You're not crazy jealous if you have like legitimate reasons to feel that way. However, now that I've heard the testimony about that Aruba thing, it's like, oh, okay, so wait, she didn't see him making out with a woman in Aruba and was justifiably jealous. She saw him say hello to someone and then scream, who the fuck was that? Go fuck yourself. Again, if we are to believe all of these witnesses are telling the truth, then it's painting a picture painting a picture that 
Karen was not a very nice person. And again, how many people are we supposed to believe would conspire and collude to cover up a murder of a man that they all seem to love? But more important than any of this, I think, is what's the proof that she actually hit him, number one. And number two, if she did actually hit him, what is the proof that it was intentional? Like, what makes it second-degree murder and not unintentional manslaughter? So, tomorrow there will be Friday, May 23rd, it is. And it's a full day of trial, as Judge Beverly Canoni said, a full day of trial tomorrow. So, I think Brian Higgins... One of the sergeants will be testifying. And see you then. See you there. Bye. See you in the next one. Got a 50% discount, so we would go periodically and get the kids' shoes. So she, John, and myself went to Reebok, got shoes, and then we went to the hillside for lunch. That was it. I wasn't friends with her. Is that someone that you had programmed in your phone as a contact? Did you have her information prior to January 29th? No. And uh, when you went to Ms. McCabe's house that morning, how was it that you knew where Ms. McCabe's house was at that time? I picked up Kaylee there a time or two for John and brought her home, if I was heading that way, because Jen's house is on the way to John's. And so you go to Ms. McCabe's house, and can you describe to the jury sort of what you observe or what you see when you're first coming up to Ms. McCabe? Um, I pulled in the driveway behind Karen's car, and Karen and Jen are in the car talking. I'm still on Bluetooth, so I can hear them. And Karen said that she remembered leaving him at Waterfall. And Jen said, no, you, you, I saw you pull up to my sister's house. And then at some point in the conversation, she said, what about my taillight? What about my taillight? And I looked, and there was a piece missing. But it was caked on with snow. You could tell there was a little black hole, but there was snow like caked on it, and it was a blizzard at this point. Now, just as far as over the course of this early morning when you're making that drive from your house to Mr. Cape's house, correct? Yes. Um, so during that time, can you describe sort of what the lighting conditions were, what the roadway conditions were, what you observed as you were driving over there? Um, it was, oh, yeah, and it was really bad driving. And uh, bad driving reference. Snow, was that right? Yes. So you get to uh, Mr. Cape's house, and during the drive from your house to Mr. Cape's house, you're speaking to both Mr. Cape and Ms. Uh, Reed? Yes. And with reference, I think you've said a couple times as far as a, a Bluetooth. Uh, so, <laughs> As far as what you're hearing on the other side of the conversation, uh, is it just one person, or are you able to hear sort of uh, everything that's going on in the call? I could hear everything. It was like a regular phone call in the car. From where you were, your impression was it was hooked up to the speaker of the call? Correct. And uh, when you get to Mr. Cape's house, uh, or the, what you were just testifying about as far as the um, tailor, um, when is it that you're making those observations? In Jen's driveway. And so about how far away from the defendant's car were you the first time that you see or your attention is drawn to this, this tailor? I was parked right behind them in the driveway. And can you describe which part of the vehicle we're looking at as far as which, which tail light that you're observing uh, this, this vantage? The right passenger. And uh, so from there, as far as um, Ms. McCabe's driveway, you make these observations. Where is it that, that you go from there? I'm saying again. So after you're making those observations and you're overhearing that conversation and you're having that conversation, you're losing, uh, where, where did the three of you go? We went to Meadows, to John's house. And how was it that each of you sort of got from <clears throat> Ms. McCabe's house to John's house on Meadows? Jen drove Karen's car, and I followed behind in my car. Um, and when you arrived there... Where, where did you go? Where did you park? Like, I pulled in. I think I pulled in right behind. She pulled her car sort of in front of the garage bays, and I pulled in the driveway behind her. And when you say she, do you know who was driving? Jen McCabe. Sorry. Driving in this reason, front passenger seat. Correct. And you're driving your car behind. Correct. So what kind of car uh, did, did you have? A Ford Explorer. Um, do you recall what color it was? Dark gray. And as far as Miss Reed, uh, do you recall what kind of vehicle she had at that point? A Lexus SUV. Do you recall what color that was? Black. Now, with respect to uh, Mr. O'Keefe, uh, do you recall what kind of uh, vehicle John O'Keefe had? He has a Traverse. And do you recall what color that was? It's like a beige green. You want, with the court's permission, if I could ask uh, to publish what's been marked as exhibit number two. Okay. Get our shoes off in the one point in the driveway. She said, "My tail light. Look at my tail light." And Initial observations you made of Mr. Cape's driveway with regard to the right rear passenger tail light of Ms. Reed's vehicle. What if any other? Uh, Yes. Now, with regard to, at some point when you get to the home, um, beyond the sort of initial observations you made of Mr. Cape's driveway with regard to the right rear passenger taillight of Ms. Reed's vehicle, what if any other uh, observations uh, did you make, or, or what if anything else did you do with reference to that area? Um, Karen did point it out at one point in the driveway. She said, my taillight, look at my taillight. And I looked at it and I said, you told me you don't remember anything from last night. She said, do you, do you think I hit him? Do you think I hit him? And I said, no, I don't think you hit him. I think you probably hit something, but let's just go in the house and look for him. And so as far as your recollection is concerned, that sort of interaction that you had looking at the taillight, when, when did that happen? I don't know if it was when, well, obviously it wasn't when we got there. It was what must have been when we were leaving to go out to look for him. When you what? I'm sorry. It, I wasn't sure if it was when we arrived or when we were leaving to go back out and look for him, but now that I've seen the video, it's obviously when we came back out of the house. Okay. And who was present for that? Who was present? Yes. Um, Jen McCabe, Karen Reed, and myself. And as far as where Ms. McCabe parked that vehicle at any point in time that you were at the house, 
have to get into the mud and pick up the shoes for that. Correct. It's the, in the garage before we entered into the mud and we took our. Now, Ms. Roberts, with reference to uh, the ring video security system that Mr. O'Keefe had at his home, um, if you know, do you know who had access to that? I do not. Now, with reference to those observations or when you were looking at the rear passenger uh, taillight of area of Ms. Reed's vehicle, how close to the vehicle were you when you were making those observations? Right in front of it. There was one piece, like a rectangle encapsulated, like whatever was broken. There was, I remember there was one piece of metal sort of sticking out. So if it was an encasement for a light of some sort, I remember looking at it and the piece was sort of sticking out and I thought, Looking at the rear passenger uh, taillight, of, and as far as where Ms. McKay parked that vehicle, at any point in time that you were at the house, did that vehicle move at all? And by that vehicle, I mean Ms. McKay. I don't think so. But where it's parked in that video is essentially where it stayed, as far as you know. I believe so. Now, with reference to those observations, or when you were looking at the rear passenger uh, taillight of area of Ms. Reed's vehicle, how close to the vehicle were you when you were making those observations? Right in front of it. There was one piece, like a rectangle, encapsulated, like whatever was broken. There was, I remember there was one piece of metal sort of sticking out. So if it was an encasement for a light of some sort, I remember looking at it, and the piece was sort of sticking out, and I thought, someone's going to catch their sleeve on that or something. And... Or something. Looking downstairs, I started looking on the other side of the couches to see if maybe he passed out somewhere. And then I went upstairs, and Karen was standing in John's room. The bed was made, and she was just standing there, and Jen had gone in to talk to Kaylee. And then I said, all right, let's, let's go. Now, he's far, not in the house. As far as, he's not in the house. As far as your knowledge of, uh, of Mr. O'Keefe, um, him not coming home when any of, of the children were home, was that something that was normal? Him not coming home if the children were home? Right. Yeah, he would not do that. And uh, obviously you knew Kaylee was there, but uh, what, if anything, did you know as to where Patrick was? He was at a friend's house. And was that something that you knew independent of, of this morning or what had transpired up to that point? Say that again? How did you find out that Patrick was, was at a friend's house? You know Karen said, I said, where's Patrick? She said he's at his friends. Um, so you were in the downstairs area of the home, is that correct? Yes. Um, and looking through the rooms, you didn't find Mr. O'Keefe, correct? No. Now, at any point in time, did you go upstairs? I did. And when you went upstairs, where in the upstairs did you go? Um, at the top of the stairs is John's bedroom, so I looked in there. I looked in the bathroom, I looked in the closet, I looked in Patrick's room. I looked in the other two bedrooms, and Kaylee was in her room. So Jen was in there, but I was looking through the, just looking through the house. And as far as uh, Mr. O'Keefe's bedroom, when you were in there, what, if anything, did you observe as far as the, the condition of the bed? The bed was made. Uh, you mentioned you looked in uh, a variety of different rooms on the second floor. Um, you said sort of two other rooms. Uh, what, if anything, were those other rooms used for, if you know? Um, I think one of them was a computer room. It was the room that faced the front of the house, and the back room had a bed in it that Mrs. O'Keefe would stay in when she would stay over. And again, just to be clear, when you say Mrs. O'Keefe, you mean John's mother? John's mother, sorry. And as far as the computer room... Uh, if anyone had access to that, if you know. Had access to the computer room? Yes. What oh. was it used for? Oh, there was a desk with a computer or a laptop. Did you know whose laptop that was, whether it was John's, whether it was the defendant's, whether it was the kid's? I, well, I, know, I don't know if it was the defendant's at the time, but it, John's laptop used to be in that room. Um, Your Honor, with the court's permission... Uh, I would ask if I could uh, publish just a couple more photos on the screen for Ms. Uh, Roberts. Okay. Uh, Ms. Gilman, if I could start with Exhibit uh, 92. Ms. Roberts, directing your attention up to the screen, do you recognize what's depicted in that photograph? That's Karen Reed's Lexus. And uh, specifically, if you could, uh, using the uh, laser pointer in front of you, direct the jury's attention to where you observed the image of that one. That's, that, that's where the metal piece I was describing was. As far as what's depicted in this photograph up on the screen, is that consistent with what you observed in Mr. O'Keefe's driveway and Mr. Cake's driveway when you saw it that Well, caked in snow, but yes. The last of the snow, yes. Yes. And uh, let's go and find out the next exhibit on the next screen. Again, Mr. Roberts, do you recognize what's depicted in this photograph? Yes. Essentially a closer up image of the same area, correct? Yes. And what's depicted in this closer up image is that also consistent with what you observed in Mr. McCabe's driveway and Mr. O'Keefe's driveway that morning. Yes. Now, Your Honor, with the court's uh, permission, I would ask uh, again if I could publish uh, a portion of what's been marked as uh, Exhibit 41. Okay. (coughs) 
or Ms. Gilman, if I could ask you to uh, fast forward to about uh, two hours, nine minutes and 30 seconds. That's John's house. And again, Mr. Roberts, directing your attention up to the screen, you recognize what's uh, sort of in front of the camera. Uh, that's Karen's car and John's car. And uh, where you observe Karen's car and John's car, again, if you could just uh, using laser pointer directly to his attention, where you observe each of those on this, in this program here. That's Karen's car. That's John's car. Are those essentially the same positions uh, that you were talking about uh, that the jury saw earlier in the ring video from his real key's house? Yes. You know, may I approach? Yes. Do you want this up on the screen or down? Uh, up for now. Okay. Uh, but just for a moment. So, Rob, I'm going to show you uh, just two photographs. Actually, just look at those from the Okay. And do you recognize those? Or do you recognize what's depicted in them? Do I recognize what? What's depicted in each of those photographs? Karen's car. Oh. Um, and uh, may I approach, Ron? Yes. I will seek to introduce you to the next specifics. Okay, is there any objection? No objection. All right, thank you. Your Honor, while those are being marked, may we approach? Hold, hold on. The photograph that I showed you just a moment ago. Yes. That's essentially a, a closer up or zoomed in image of, of what's in the same still uh, images of solid fibers, correct? Yes. Uh, and again, if you could use a laser pointer, just a regular attention to the damage that you observe on the right rear passenger, tail light of misreads the able Okay. So when you get the <laughs> Now, you go look through the home. You don't find Mr. O'Keefe. And uh, what, what happens? Um, then I said, let's go. Let's go look for him. If you, he might be walking home, or if you thought he got hit by a plow, let's just... And Jen and Karen wanted to go back to... 34 Fairview, where they were at Jen's sister. Jen said she saw her pull up to 34 Fairview the night before. So Karen really wanted to go back there. I was the one that said, no, let's drop a car off, go to Meadows and look through the house, and then we'll start looking if he's not in the house. So that's what we did. We got in the car, and we were going to head back to Jen's sister's house. And so this conversation, as far as the defendant, uh, as you're testifying, really wanting to go to Fairview, when, when did that occur in relation to when you got to Ms. O'Keefe's? Um, on the way from Jen McCabe's house to John's house in the car. So this is over the Bluetooth as you're driving? Yes. Karen said I left him at Waterfall, and Jen said, no, I saw you pull up in front of my sister's. And um, so after coming out of Mr. O'Keefe's house, you exit the same way that you entered? Yes. Come out the garage door, get into your car? Yes. And um, if you could describe to the jury sort of where was everybody seated in your car when you did it? I was driving. Karen was in the back seat, and Jen was in the passenger seat. And as far as uh, Ms. McCabe's sister's house, um, at the time, did you know where that was or who her sister was or anything like that? I didn't even know she had a sister. And um, you know about how, how long a drive or how far a drive or what the route was that you took going from Meadows to her sister's house? I think we went main roads because we were looking to see. I mean, I don't know what we were looking for, but we were looking for him. I don't know if we thought he was walking home or if he got hit by a plow. So we went main roads. Um, we pulled out. I think we went Bolivar Street. And then Jen was giving directions because I didn't know where we were going. And uh, to be clear, Bolivar Street, you're talking about that's B-O-L-I-V-A-R? Yes. Um, and so then Ms. McCabe is then giving you directions as you're driving, correct? Correct. Um, now, as you're driving, um, again, as far as did you, what, if anything, did you see as far as plows or, or how were the roads treated at that time? What, what if anything, did you observe in reference to that? Um, it was bad driving. There were plows out, but it was really bad driving. And... 
the visibility as you were driving from Ms. Rokey's house to uh, Ms. McCabe's sister's house, um, how would you describe the visibility? It was very poor. It was in the middle of a blizzard. Now, when you get to the street, at some point you're, you're directed by Ms. McCabe to Fairview Road, correct? Correct. And when you get to Fairview Road, do you recall whether or not you took a left or a right, or how did you come on to Fairview Road? I, off of Chapman Street, I took a right onto Fairview. You took a right from Chapman onto Fairview? Correct. And as you're coming down uh, Fairview Road, um, what, if anything, did you note or observe as far as the sort of elevation of the roadway? Um, you go downhill. You go downhill? Yes. Um, in this particular area of Cam, obviously you've, you've lived in Cam for several years. Are you somewhat familiar with this area of Cam? Yeah. And how is it that you were familiar with the area of Cam prior to the state if you've never been to Mr. Case? Um, the commuter rail is right near there that I would take to work. Are there any schools in that area as well? Yes, the John F. Kennedy School. And um, you mentioned that your son played baseball, correct? Yes, and my, my son and John's nephew also went to the home daycare across the street from the JFK. Now, <clears throat> Your Honor, with the court's permission, I would ask to uh, just publish a, a brief portion of what's been marked as Exhibit 12. Okay. Gentlemen, what I'm going to ask is if you could um, push this video forward to two minutes and 30 seconds. consistent with what you observed that morning as you were driving around going from uh, Mr. Keith's house to uh, Mr. Cave's sister's house. Yes. And uh, the turn that this vehicle was taking at this point in the video about two minutes and four seconds in, do you recognize what street that vehicle was turning onto? I believe it's Fairview. Uh, let me see As you're driving from Mr. O'Keefe's house to um, this address on Fairview Road uh, that you've never been to before, what, what's going on inside the car? Um, Karen was frantic. She wouldn't put her seatbelt on, and I was getting nervous because we're driving a blizzard. She kept leaning in between the two seats. Um, which I think at some point she was texting in the back seat, and then she'd be leaning. She was just frantic the whole morning. And as far as her screaming, do you recall anything specifically that she was screaming or, or what if any sort of conversation was going on in the car as you were driving? There was some conversation about a woman I didn't know that was Bella's mom, and she said Bella's mom never liked me. I think Bella's, Bella lived near Jen's sister, maybe. I don't know. Some conversation about Bella's mom, and Karen said she didn't like me. And so I recall where you were in your, in your traffic when that topic of conversation came up? No, I don't recall. Now, in reference to uh, following that, what, if anything, did you say in, in regards to uh, any other sort of women? Any other what? Um, following that conversation in regards to Bell's mom, we didn't know. What, if anything, uh, did, did you say or introduce in the conversation? Uh, Fairview Road runs um, along Spring Road, Spring Street, I think it is. Spring Lane. So Spring Lane and Fairview are both off of Chapman Street, and there was a woman. He... No, I don't recall. And I didn't know that was Bella's mom. And she said, Bella's mom never liked me. I think Bella's... Bella lived near Jen's sister, maybe? I don't know. Some conversation about Bella's mom, and Karen said she didn't like me. And uh, do you recall where you were in your, in your travels when that topic of conversation came up? No, I don't recall. Now, in reference to uh, following that, what, if anything, did you say in, in regards to uh, any other sort of women? Any other what? Um, following that conversation in regards to Bella's mom, we didn't know. What, if anything, uh, did, did you... Say or introduce into the conversation. Fairview Road runs um, along Spring Road, Spring Street, I think it is. Spring Lane. So Spring Lane and Fairview are both off at Chapman Street, and there was a woman he dated that lived on Spring Lane. So when Jen was telling me where her sister's house was, I said, I don't know where Fairview is, and she said it's near Spring Lane, and I said, oh, where the dance instructor lived. John had once dated a dance instructor. And then Karen said, do you think he could have gone there? Do you think that's where he could have been? No, I was... I was just using it as a reference point. She said it's near Spring Lane, and I knew that the dance instructor lived on Spring Lane. And just to be clear, when you say the dance instructor, this would be for his, his niece, Kaylee? Correct. And uh, you indicated that the two of them being Mr. O'Keefe and the dance instructor are dated at some point in the past, right? Yes. Uh, how long ago was that? Oh, it was when Kaylee was little. She was probably like five. So 
almost 10 years before this date that you're driving along. <coughs> now, as you're driving along and driving down Fairview, uh, what is it that, that you're doing? What, if anything, do you observe that you cave doing? Then what, if anything, do you observe that fence? Well, we were looking for John walking or wherever he may be. So I'm driving and looking on both sides. And I think Jen was looking on both sides. And Karen was, she would be in the back seat, then she'd be in between us, then she'd be in the back seat, and then in between us. And uh, as you came down uh, the hill on Fairview, um, what, if anything, what happened then? Um, Jen said, my sister's house is right up here. And all of a sudden, Karen said, there he is, there he is. Let me the F out of this car. And she started kicking the door. And uh, how was she kicking the door? With her feet. Well, how was she kicking the door? How hard was she kicking oh. the door? Um, pretty hard. I mean, she wanted to get out of the car, but it was locked because once you start driving, the back doors lock. So I looked over and I didn't see anything. And I looked at Jen and I said, she's crazy. And I unlocked the door and I sat back and watched. And she ran over to a mound of snow. And so as the time you're driving down the road, have you seen anything as you're driving down or looking at the side of the road? Have you seen anything on your side of the vehicle? No. And when you say she gets out of the vehicle, is it your side or, or passenger side where Mr. Cave is? That The driver's side. So she gets out of the driver's side of the vehicle and the back passenger, correct? Correct. And how quickly does she go sort of from where, from your car to, to where she ends up? She ran over to the mound. And at that point in time, even when she runs over, could you see what she was running over to? At some point, I realized it was, it was the shape of a body. And, and when was that that you realized? When in this sort of sequence were you able to realize that? That was in seconds. Once she ran over to his body, I said, oh, my God. Then she lifted up his shirt and started to lay on him. And uh, when you stopped uh, to let her out, where were you in, in relation to that mound of snow or, or what you learned? Well, I think my car was like in the middle of the road. I just stopped. And in relation to uh, where the mound of snow was, had you driven past it at that point? So where was it? Yes. So it was located behind your vehicle? Yeah. Um, Ms. Gilman, if you could, I would ask just uh, to play on that for about six minutes and 30 seconds. <laughs> That's my car. Is that essentially where you parked your car when Miss Reed started kicking the doors and got out and ran over? Yes. Now, from this video, do you see uh, where in relation to your vehicle, uh, Mr. O'Keefe, where you found Mr. O'Keefe? With the pointer. Okay. Miss Newman, if you could uh, again display for about this. Um, that is Jen McCabe. That's Karen Reed. That's me.
Um, in relation to what you just saw in the video, as far as at some point uh, the rear sort of uh, tailgate or hatchback on, on your SUV that was in the up position, is that correct? Yes. And uh, do you recall why that was? Because I was having Jen get the baby blankets to wrap around him out of my car. And is that something that you just sort of have in the back of your car at all times? Yeah. Now, at any point in time uh, in that sequence, um, did you... Um, call anybody or, or have any sort of phone calls that you made that went to voicemail at that time? Did I? Yes. Um, I don't know. And uh, so nothing that you recall, is that correct? Correct. And did you observe Ms. McKay make any phone calls that just sort of went to voicemail and she left her phone in your car? Objection. <clears throat> Sustained. Let me take it back um, to when you're pulling. Um, so as far as the conditions when you pull up uh, and the defendant's banging on the door and gets out and, and runs over to Mr. O'Keefe. Um, what's depicted in that video, obviously, without <coughs> your vehicle being in the middle of the roadway, is that a fair and accurate portrayal of, of what the road looked like and, and sort of what you saw upon your arrival? Yes. Um, so after the defendant gets out of the vehicle, what did you do? Where did you go? Um, when I realized it was him or someone, um, I ran over and I dug his head out, grabbed the snow. <laughs> And uh, to the call, um, you recognized uh, the person in the cell was Mr. O'Keefe. Once I dug his head out, yes. And uh, you recall how his body was positioned as far as um, how was he on his stomach, on his back, on his side? He was on his back. And uh, so you brushed the snow away from, from his head, is that correct? Off his face. And when you were brushing uh, the snow off his face, what, if anything, did you observe uh, about his face or, or the condition of him? He had blood coming out of his nose and his mouth. <laughs> And his right eye was, it looked like a golf ball. His left eye was fine. But the right eye looked like a golf ball. Now, you mentioned that you wiped some snow from around his head. What, if anything else, did you observe on, on the, the rest of his body? Um, he was bleeding in the back of the head. So when I was wrapping the, I don't know why I was wrapping blankets around his head, but I just, I didn't know. Um, he had a cut on the back of his head. Do you recall which side of his head that cut was on? I don't. It just was blood on the blanket that was under him, under his head. Now, as far as the rest of his body, did that have snow on it as well? Say it again, I'm sorry? The rest of his body, from, separate from his head area. What, if any, snow did you observe on, on the rest of his body? Um, he was completely covered. And uh, you know about how much snow was, was covering the rest of his body? I would say like four inches, maybe three. I don't really, it was, I don't really remember exactly how many, but he was covered. And uh, so with reference to Mr. O'Keefe and when you arrived there, um, three of you being you, the defendant, and Ms. McCabe, um, what is it that, that you were doing when you first sort of, sort of come over to, to Mr. O'Keefe? Um, well, Karen was laying on top of him, and I told her to get off him because I was going to do CPR. And I said, Jen, you need to call 911. Um, and I started CPR on his chest compressions. And then Karen was giving him mouth-to-mouth. -mouth. And as far as CPR goes, is that something that you had any training in prior to this? Yes. And, and can you tell the jury a little bit about that as far as what, what if any training did you have as far as CPR was concerned? I get um, CPR certified every two years through the American Red Cross at work. Um, so you start doing chest compressions, is that right? Correct. And you direct Ms. McCabe to call 911? Yes. And what was the defendant doing about that? She was doing mouth to mouth and she was frantic again, running around. And... As she was running around, what if anything else was she doing or saying while she was running around? Um, did I hit him? Did I hit him? Is he dead? Is he dead? Is that something that she said once or more than once? More than once. And similar to sort of the, the tonality or the volume of the voice that you were describing before, was that consistent uh, when you're there sort of in front of the house? Yes. Now, in relation to where you were with Mr. O'Keefe, uh, obviously you've never been in this house before, is that right? Correct. Um, what, if anything, did you observe as far as uh, overhead lights or street lights or anything like that around that area where you, where you found Mr. O'Keefe? There was a fire hydrant and there was some weird like electrical box thing sticking out of the ground. Uh, but you don't recall any sort of like overhead lights or anything like that? I don't recall. Now, um, 
this process of you sort of doing compressions um, and Ms. Reed is doing mouth to mouth and, and then running around is, is the, the mouth to mouth that she's doing is that really consistent or is it intermittent between when is the running around in relation to the mouth to mouth? Uh, I don't remember which was first. Or I was just doing, I was concentrating on doing chest compressions. And so while you're doing uh, the chest compressions, at some point do uh, first responders start to arrive? Correct. And about how long was it from the time that you sort of get out of the vehicle, go over, realize it's Mr. O'Keefe, et cetera, and to when the first responders arrived? I, I don't know. It wasn't long. Maybe under 10 minutes. During that time, um, or during any of the amount of time that you were there, did you see anybody uh, from any of the houses on the street come out of the house or, or any, any neighbors come out or anything like that? No. Um, once, if you recall, uh, do you recall whether it was police or fire or ambulance or who, who showed up first? I don't know. I think the police showed up first or the EMT. I just know the EMTs came over and said, we'll take it from here. I wasn't paying attention to what else was going on. So you're sort of focused on chest compressions. And at some point, some paramedic comes over and tells you they've got this. Yes. And so after that, where did you go? Um, after that, where did I go? I stayed in the area. I think I went back over to the car. And um, as paramedics are working <coughs> on, um, you're over by your vehicle, correct? I think so. And so where was, uh, what were you doing, and, and where was Mr. Cave, and, and where was the defendant at that point? Um, Karen was running around the body while the EMTs were trying to work on him. She was just frantic. And so you're over by the car, and Ms. Reed is running around over where Mr. O'Keefe is? Yes. Where was Ms. McCabe? I don't know. She was somewhere around the car. So closer to you than to where Mr. O'Keefe was? I, can't, I don't know. Now, where Mr. O'Keefe was, if you know, um, where was he in relation to, to the roadway or, or the, the paved sort of pathway of Fairview Road? I don't know because you couldn't tell which was the road and which was the grass. Like, you couldn't tell which, where the road began and ended. So I don't know. Now, <clears throat> you described the defendant sort of running around Mr. O'Keefe frantically. What, if anything, was she saying about that? Um, is he dead? Is he dead? Is he dead? And that sort of phraseology or the way she put that, was, was that consistent throughout? Is that how she stated it? Yes. And again, in that same sort of loud uh, volume voice at the time? Yes. Now, at some point, um, Mr. O'Keefe is taken from where he is uh, by the paramedics to an ambulance, correct? Yes. And as he's being taken off the ground, what, if anything, did you observe in that area? Um, his phone was under him, and it was grass. Now, as far as the grass that you observed, um, how was that in relation to sort of the rest of, of the area where Mr. O'Keefe was? Everything else had snow. So everything else is covered in snow, and when he's lifted off the ground underneath his body, is that where the grass is? Yes. And um, his phone was where in relation to his body? As far as when he's lifted up, what part of his body had been opened? Uh, like his, maybe his shoulder, maybe it was like his back. So when they lifted him up, it was under where like his, whatever that, the right side of his back. And what I'm asking is basically sort of up towards the shoulder blade or down towards his lower back if you... In the middle. Um, and when you saw... Uh, the phone on the grass, what, if anything, did you do with, with Mr. O'Keefe's phone? I picked it up. I put it in my pocket. And at some point, one of the first responders asked if I had it. I handed it over. Do you recall who that first responder was? No. Do you recall even whether it was a police officer, a firefighter, or a paramedic? Or... No. <clears throat> now, as Mr. O'Keefe is being taken from where he was located in the fountain to the ambulance, uh, what, what happens then? What goes on from that? Um, at some point, Officer Good told Karen to calm down because she was frantic. Um, and at some point, they, Jen and Karen were in the back of a police cruiser to warm up. Um, I was standing outside watching the ambulance because I could see in through the ambulance that they were moving things and working on them. And so what kind of conversation did you have with the defendant or, and or Ms. McCabe in reference to what you were seeing through the back of the ambulance? Um, I said, they're working on him. They're working on him. And at one point, Karen grabbed the front of my jacket and screamed in my face and said, are they working on him? Is he alive? And I said, they're working on him. They're working on him. They wouldn't be working on him if he was dead. And then um, she had us hold hands and pray. And then at some point, she had blood on her hands, and she, was, she told us she had her period. So I think she was just in a state of shock, maybe. And what, if anything, did either you or, or Ms. McCabe say to her when she said that? Um, we said, no, that's not your blood. That's John's. 
and um, what happened then? Then um, the ambulance drove away. And if you know about how long was it from the time that you were told by the paramedic to uh, sort of step away from Mr. O'Keefe, they had this, um, from that point to when the ambulance drove away? I don't know. It, I don't think it was long. I watched them work on whatever they were doing in the back of the ambulance, and they got in the ambulance and drove away. And um, after the ambulance left, uh, where did the three of you go, or, or where did you go, where did Ms. Reed go, where did Ms. Reed go? Um, uh, Karen, I had her in my car. Jen was going up to the door to her sister's house, and the police, I said to the police, I had been on the phone now. I had called Mrs. O'Keefe. I had called John's mother. I had called John's father. At some point, Karen was on the phone with John's sister-in-law, Erin, telling him John's dead. So I grabbed the phone from her. I said, he's not dead. He's in the back of an ambulance. He's been in an accident. Um, and she said she was going to, that Paul was going to go, John's brother, um, to the hospital that they were bringing John to. So I spoke to Mr. I called Mr. O'Keefe. He didn't answer. Uh, next question. That, that'll stand. The next question. So you call Mr. O'Keefe and Mrs. O'Keefe, John's parents? Correct. At some point, you have a conversation with them, Correct. Correct. And do you know why it was that Ms. McCabe was going into the house on, on Fairview? Objection. Do you know why? Yeah. Um, to wake her sister, I think. And <clears throat> after those conversations, so you grab the phone from the defendant, you speak to Erin O'Keefe, correct? Yes. And <clears throat> following those conversations with members of the O'Keefe family, where is it that you were going? I asked Mrs. O'Keefe if she had four-wheel drive, and she said no, and Mr. O'Keefe had a van that didn't have four-wheel drive. So I said, I'm going to come get you, and I'll take you to the hospital. All right, so why don't we end this now for now? Okay. All right, jurors will take the motion. Yep. All right, so why don't we end this now for So now? right here, I'm about to show. All right, jurors will take the motion. During the break, you can see Karen Lee talking yep. to her lawyers. And I just thought it was interesting to, to just see her facial expressions a little bit. There was another part where she was laughing really hard. And then it looked like somebody said something to her from the gallery. But I wasn't able to catch that. But anyway, just curious about how they are interacting here. So I also decided to just kind of scroll through. I was really looking for that scene that I thought somebody said something to her. And I just found a few parts about where they were filming her I thought was a little interesting. So here's a part where she turns around and she says something. Does she say that bitch? Let's see. She's going to turn around any second. What did she say? The person walks right by. So, okay, I'm going to play it one more time. What'd she say right here? Can you lip read? Okay, take a look. She's going to turn around in three, two, one. What'd she say? I don't know. I think it's interesting. Who's she talking to anyway? All right, and now the next scene here, there is a sidebar because there was an objection regarding some evidence or something that Marietta Sullivan is about to say, and the objection is overruled. So, look, you're going to see she's quite disappointed. Jurors, please be mindful right of that second instruction that I gave you so? regarding um, evidence of statements no. made by John O'Keefe nah. for the limited She's purpose of establishing right his I mean, I would be too mind. if the thing was going to come in. And I will fully give you this instruction again at the end of the case. So but it's the same one that I already gave you. Go ahead, Mr. Lally. Ms. Sullivan, with regard to uh, the day of so the So I'm just showing a few of her facial expressions just because I haven't really done that at all. And please, those three cautions, do not discuss this All right, so I found the clip I was looking for. It was at the very end of the day. It's coming up. If you 
happen to see, hear, or read anything about the case, please disregard okay, it. Let us know. Just right leave right everything here, ending. literally, figuratively. She's giving you all the instructions and admonishments. And then I'm going to show the span over to Karen Reed, and we will see her facial expression. So Alan Jackson saying something to her, she's laughing, and then somebody else seems to say something to her, and she does like, so that, like, I don't know what is happening or what's being said, but then she's like, oh, okay. so she makes that expression. So I just thought that that was kind of interesting. So as you'll see over here, you'll see John O'Keefe's brother in that, that blue shirt right there, the bald man. And I zoom in. Okay, so they're laughing. I wonder what they're laughing about. This is the end of the day. Then somebody says something to her. Right there. I wish I could know what she was saying. that face. I'll show it with one last time. Something is funny. And then somebody, I don't know who's sitting over there. I wonder who's there to support her. And I wonder what information they're sharing with her. I mean, I do feel bad for her, even though they said all that fucked up stuff about her. I still, I feel bad. And, um, okay, so now we're going to get into the testimony that I recorded. It's about an hour and a half or so. So enjoy and leave your questions and comments. See ya. And this was just the rest, the last couple seconds before the end of the day, before Judge Beverly Canoni gave them the last instructions, etc. This was yesterday. But now we're going back to more testimony. Thank you. All right, so hopefully we will start and finish that one witness on. Back to when um, you first, Mr. Uh, where Mr. O'Keefe is, is on the grass, um, and at any point in time when you uh, observed him, what, if any, observations did you make as far as how Mr. O'Keefe was, was dressed at that time? Was he dressed? Yes. Um, I, he had jeans on. I couldn't really tell because he was covered in snow, but I know that he had, I think he had two layers on because when. The defendant lifted his shirt. Do you recall if any one of those layers was like a, a winter jacket or any kind of heavy coat or anything like that? No. I, I'm sorry. No, you don't recall? Or no, no it was not a coat. <laughs> now, I'll take it back to when you were in front of the house and uh, Mr. O'Keefe is in the back of the ambulance and at some point in time that ambulance leaves. Is that correct? Correct. And uh, do you know where the ambulance was going? Good Samaritan Hospital. And following that, um, you mentioned that Ms. McCabe went inside the house, correct? Yes. And do you recall uh, what it was that caused her to go inside the house? Okay. No, I'll allow that. Not what anyone said. Um, I think she was going to wake her sister. And uh, after that, was there anybody else that's uh, beyond sort of first responders or police officers and things that any other sort of civilian people show up uh, that you recall? Um, Matt showed up at some point. Matt, Jen's husband, Matt. Um, and that was before you left, is that correct? Yes. And just to be clear, you had, we'll get to this more in a moment, but you had left from the, the house once, come back, and then left again? Yes. And when her husband, Matt McCabe, showed up, uh, which of those times was that? Um, I think it was, he was there when I left the first time. And uh, did you have any conversation with him? Um, I just said, he said, do you want, I said, I'm going to get the O'Keefe's. He said, do you want me to come with you? Um, and I said, no, no, no. So he went in the house. And when you left, who, if anyone, initially when you left, who, if anyone left with you? I left with Karen Reed. And uh, as uh, you're leaving your car, you're driving, is that correct? Yes. Where's Miss Reed in the car at that point? Say it again? Where was Miss Reed in your car at that point? In the passenger seat. And uh, as you were leaving, what, if anything, were the two were doing or talking about or, or what was going on when, when you left that person? Um, as we were leaving, she was saying to me, if anything happens to John, I'm going to kill myself. You need to take care of these kids. And how did you respond? He's not going to die. No one's doing anything of that nature or something of that nature, I said. And as far as you're driving away, Batman and you're facing towards the press, is that right? Yes. And so when you left, are you following in that sort of same direction towards Cedar Crest? I took a right onto Cedar Crest. And then where did you go from there? And then I got to Dedham Street, and I went to take a right. And then Officer Good, Officer Good let me go to pick up the O'Keefe's to take them. <laughs> I had to give him my phone number so that he could get in touch with me if he needed to. So he did call, and he said, do you have Miss Reed with you? And I said, yes. And he said, please bring her back. Her parents have called in um, a suicide. They, they said she's, she's saying she's suicidal, so they wanted to be sectioned. And so coming back to that in a moment, but... <laughs> 
before you had left the scene, you hadn't talked to any police officers or anything uh, at that time, correct? No, other than my name and phone number, but no. So you gave them your information and then said, I have to go pick up your keys? Yes. Um, so you get that call uh, from Officer Goods, uh, and then you come back to the house, is that right? Yes. And during any of that time, uh, you recall the defendants, I, I know you had mentioned she spoke to Erin O'Keefe. Uh, was there anybody else uh, that the defendants spoke to or talked to while, while you were with her in the car? She spoke to her mother. Um, and then I ended up taking the phone and speaking to her mother, and I gave her my phone number, and I said, I'm going to go to the hospital. She said, please make sure she does not have her purse. She has medication in her purse I don't want her to take. And then when you arrived uh, back at the scene, uh, what happened? Um, she just got out of the car and walked to the ambulance. And who, if anyone, did she walk? And by she, you mean the defendant? I'm sorry, yes. And um, who, if anyone, did the defendant walk from your car to the ambulance with? Um, she just walked. I think she just walked by herself. I had her phone because I had been talking to her mother. So then one of the first responders came over and said, do you have her phone? And I said, yes. Her mother said, make sure she does not have her purse. And then following that conversation with uh, one of the first responders, where, where did you go from there? I went to go pick up the O'Keeffe's. And as far as your drive uh, from Canton, you went to where, where did the O'Keeffe's live? Braintree. Um, so your drive from Canton to Braintree and then subsequently from Braintree to Brock, um, what, if anything, did you observe about sort of the driving conditions of that? Um, I was actually on the phone with Katie Camerano and I spun out, did a complete spun a couple times on 93, right near the Braintree exit, so that when I got to the O'Keeffe's, that we went backwards to Brockton, because I, I didn't want to go on the highway. And as far as the O'Keeffe's, as far as in your car from Braintree to Brockton, that was both John's mother and father? Correct. And uh, at some point, you get to the Good Samaritan Hospital in Brockton, correct? Correct. And do you know what time it was that you got there? I don't know. When you, when you arrived, where is it that you and, and the O'Keeffe's sort of go within the hospital? Um, Paul, had, his, John's brother Paul had already arrived, um, and then we all walked in. We were in the waiting area. Um, John's cousin actually works on the switchboard. We had been talking to her on the way in because with COVID restrictions, we didn't know if we were going to be able to get in or, um, so she had come out from the switchboard, her office, um, because she knew there had been an accident. So she came out to greet her family. And then I asked her to take me to the bathroom to clean up and to the chapel. And why was it that you had to go clean up? Say it again. Why was it that you had to go clean up? Because I had blood on my hands. Now, um, Ms. Roberts, you mentioned that uh, during part of the drive uh, from Canton to Braintree, you spoke to Ms. Camerano, correct? Yes. And during either that drive or the subsequent drive from Braintree to Brockton, who, if anyone else, did you speak to over the phone? And Karen called me repeatedly from the ambulance, asking if I was going to come to the hospital. And she called in the O'Keefe's were in the car um, and said she dropped him off at a party. And Mrs. O'Keefe said, you just left him. And Mr. O'Keefe said, leave her alone. She's been through enough. Um, she called a few times while we were on the ride. And then she called a lot when we were at the hospital, asking if I knew anything, if he was dead, is he dead? She would hang up and then call back, hang up and then call back. And if you know about how many times? Before, I, at least 10. And that same sort of phraseology that she was using on scene as far as she dead, she repeated that in the phone call to the hospital? Yes. Now, um, once you arrive at the hospital and you're able to clean up a little bit, where did you go from there? What, what happened? There? I went to the chapel and I said a prayer and then... I went in and talked to John's cousin, and she said that Dr. Rice was going to ask to meet with the family and that they would be told um, how John was doing and that they would bring John, John's family back to see John. So when I came out, they were being called in by Dr. Rice, and I sat in the waiting area. And uh, after some period of time sitting in the waiting area, what, what happened? Then? Um, Mrs. O'Keefe came out and told me John was gone. <laughs> and then she asked if I wanted to see him. So I did because I figured it would be better than when I last saw him. Maybe he was cleaned up, or, but it was not. It was worse. Sorry, man. Like, as far as say that it was back into a room where, where John was, is that right? Yes. And what did you see? Um, he was in a neck brace, and both eyes were huge. Whereas when I found him, it was only one, but they were like black, almost like filled with, I don't know, blood or fluid. They were huge. Uh, beyond what you observed in his eyes, what, if anything else, did you, did you see uh, on John's body as you were? He had scratches on his arm. Uh, do you recall which arm it was? His right arm. Paul, where on his arm? Um, like here. Um, so that's where the, like, the witness is pointing to her forearm? Yes. Um, following that, as far as going in to, uh, to see John, uh, what, what happened then? Um, we came back out to the waiting area. <sighs> Mrs. O'Keefe wanted to get his necklace off, but I couldn't get it, so her and Paul went back in to get the necklace off, and Karen had called me at some point from the hospital and said, my father's going to be coming. Can you just keep a lookout for him? So I said, so when he, Mr. Reed, her father, walked in, Mr. O'Keefe recognized him, and he said, that's Karen's father. So I went over and I said, Mr. Reed, Mr. O'Keefe would like to speak to you. And then I just stood there. I didn't know what to do. And at some point, did you, did you leave from the hospital? I, I did. I took Mr. O'Keefe in my car, and Paul took Mrs. O'Keefe in his. And where did the, where did the, the two vehicles, where did you go? 
I dropped Mr. O'Keefe off at John's house, and then I went home. And uh, without getting into too much detail as far as the road conditions that you described earlier, how were they? It was absolutely horrible. You, I told Mr. O'Keefe, if you see a front door in your vision, we are about to hit a house because I can't see where we're going. And my windshield wiper broke. <sighs> now, um, so you dropped Mr. O'Keefe off at uh, John's house on Meadows, is that right? Yes. And uh, Ms. Reed's vehicle, was that still there at that point? I think so. I don't recall, but I think so. And then you went home, is that correct? Yes. Later on uh, that day or that afternoon, um, if anyone came to your house to, to speak to you in regards to what? There were two officers, but I don't remember their names. And do you recall which department they were from? The state police. Um, <clears throat> as far as the officers that came, following that conversation, um, when was the next time, if at all, that you had any conversation with Mr. O'Keefe and or Ms. Reed in regards to the group? So during that conversation, I... Mr. O'Keefe. Ms. Reed, the defendant, and uh, his niece and nephew, Patrick and Taylor? Correct, yes. And uh, if you know, in relation to your son, um, as far as uh, his, Mr. O'Keefe's nephew, Patrick, uh, where are they in relation to our age? Uh, they're like three, three years apart. She knew had two rooms uh, for them to, you know, figure that piece out. Um, I don't handle any of that. I put, so the, the, the pool, I mean, steps-wise, maybe 200. Um, Josh's, the, him, Karen, and it was, um, we were at the pool, so it was not, not long after they had landed. He texted me and said, we're here. And Ben and I jumped out of the pool and went to the lobby to see him. And then on the way back from the lobby, I saw somebody banging on the window on the, the left-hand side of the rooms, and I didn't know who it was. And then I saw Kaylee, and I was like, oh, well, that must be Karen. And again, was this the first time that you had seen Karen face-to-face -face or, or met Ms. Reed? Yes. And just for clarity purposes, as far as Ms. Reed is concerned, you see her in the courtroom today? Yes. Can you just identify as to where she's seated or an article of clothing that she's wearing? She's right there. Because that's a record of like, identification of the identified. Okay. Thank you. Now, after you see this person bang on the window and you recognize Kaylee, what, what happened? Um, she came out. She gave me a big hug, said, it's nice to meet you. Um, I've heard so much about you. I recognized you from pictures. And uh, following along from there, uh, what happened then as far as, as far as the day was concerned? Uh, so as I mentioned, it was Josh's birthday. We had already made uh, plans to go out for dinner. Our friends who had been there since Christmas have a 17-year-old daughter who um, watched our children so we could go out for dinner. Uh, I mentioned it to John. I said, you know, we'll just add you to the reservation. You can join us for dinner. Um, the kids can stay with Chloe. And they said, absolutely. So we, we all went out for dinner that evening um, to Scream and Eagle. And Scream and Eagle, where is that in relation to the, to the hotel? The it's probably about a 15-ish minute cab ride. And when you arrived there, can, what, if anything, do you recall about sort of the dinner or, or how it went? So um, we were sitting outside on the patio. Um, it was um, Karen, myself, our friend Laura. Across from Laura was her husband, Dave. Josh was in front of me, and John was in front of Karen. And um, what, if anything, specific do you recall about the dinner or sort of how, what happened? At, at so we... Um, the, the waiter came over, he ordered, he started taking drink orders. Karen placed her order, I placed mine, Laura placed hers, Dave placed his, and then Josh ordered a dirty martini with blue cheese stuffed olives. Okay. I'll allow it, I, I don't know where it's going, and you can move to strike if it, unless you wanted to see me, Mr. Okay. 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 So, Sullivan, turning back to uh, at the restaurants, uh, the drinks that are ordered, people have what they have. Um, and at the end of uh, the evening, as far as uh, the bill comes in something, correct? Correct. And what, if anything, do you recall about that? Uh, Karen had paid the bill prior to us receiving it. And what, if any reaction did you or anyone have in the uh, The entire table was um, kind of taken aback, you know, said it wasn't necessary, um, wanted to... Venmo or, or, or give cash or something along those lines, and, and she declined, saying that um, she, she was honored to be there and, and wanted to pay for it. Turning your attention to the following day, um, what, if anything, do you recall about the next day uh, being that would have been, I'm sorry, 31st, is that correct? Yes. Um, so turning your attention to December 31st, 2021, uh, what, if anything, do you recall about that day in, in specific regard to, uh, to Mr. O'Keefe and Mr. Uh, John was very vocal on the 30th on how he just wanted to sit in the pool and watch the Alabama game. And he was a 
pretty big Alabama fan, is that correct? Yes. Um, and so over the course of that day, uh, what if any interaction did you have with either, uh, sorry, with Mr. Ocean, what if any interaction did you have with him? Um, I saw him in the pool. I know he was he was sitting uh, at the pool bar watching the game with Josh. Um, I saw the kids. I, I recall seeing Karen. I don't remember if we spoke or not. Um, but it was mostly in the pool because we were waiting for the rest of our friends to show up. Now, amongst uh, the rest of your friends that showed up, um, do you have any siblings? I do. And how many siblings do you have? I have two. And uh, brother or sister? What we tend to do moment, as far as Ms. Reed was concerned, prior to um, your arrival in Aruba, did you have her phone number or had you contact, did you have any way of contacting your children and everybody? Correct. And seatings. So uh, my mother was with us as well. Now, back to Now, when you came down to the pool area, as far as Mr. O'Keefe and or Ms. Reed was concerned, uh, did you see them in that area? Um, I saw John, I want to say around 10, 10.30-ish. I don't know the exact time. It was definitely before midnight. And where in relation to the hotel did you see him at 10, 10.30? I, he was standing behind me at the pool bar. And at some point, um, at some point, does your sister come out to the pool area after putting your mother to bed? Yeah, so uh, right before I saw John at the pool bar, I saw my sister. She came out, and she was uh, visibly upset. And, uh, Your Honor, in regard, in regard excuse me, to uh, the construction that you had requested about this, maybe. All right, thank you. So, juries, you're about to hear testimony about certain conduct uh, or behavior allegedly committed by Ms. Reed. Um, be mindful that the defendant is not charged with committing any crimes other than those charged within the indictments. Uh, the witness's testimony may not and indeed may Instruction that you would request about this, maybe. All right, thank you. So, juries, you're about to hear testimony about certain conduct uh, or behavior allegedly committed by Ms. Reed. Um, be mindful that the defendant is not charged with committing any crimes other than those charged within the indictments. Uh, the witness's testimony may not and indeed must not be considered by you as any evidence that the defendant has a bad character uh, or as evidence that she has a propensity to commit the crimes with which she has been charged. You may not take the defendant's prior acts as a substitute for proof that the defendant committed the crimes charged here. But... You may consider the act solely on the limited issue of the state of mind uh, of the defendant and the nature of her relationship with John O'Keefe, as it might go to motive or intent. You may not consider this evidence for any other purpose. Specifically, you may not use it to conclude that if the defendant committed the act or acts, uh, that she must also have committed the offenses with which she's charged. You can only use the evidence for the limited purpose of how it goes to the defendant's state of mind, the nature of her relationship with John O'Keefe, as it may go to motive. And just for the records, my findings are the same that I made at sidebar previously. Go ahead, Mr. Lally. Thanks. Now, with regard uh, to, at some point, you took the out to the pool area where you were, is that right? Correct. And do you know where Mr. O'Keefe Go ahead, Mr. Lally. Thanks. Now, with regard uh, to, at some point, you took the out to the pool area where you were, is that right? Correct. And do you know where Mr. O'Keefe was at that point? I do not know. And when your sister comes out to the pool area, what, what happened? Um, she said... Okay. Yeah, that, that's sustained. I thought you were doing something else. When your sister comes out to the pool, um, how would you describe her demeanor when she comes out? No, I'll allow that. She was frustrated. And at some point, did you have a conversation, without regard to what the conversation was, at some point, did you have a conversation with her uh, about something that had just happened? Yes. Now, following that conversation with your sister, um, at some point, subsequent to that, <coughs> Mr. O'Keefe uh, come back out to the pool. After I spoke with her, yes, he came out to the pool area. And you know about how long a period of time it was between the time that your sister came out to the pool area and Mr. O'Keefe came out to the pool area? I mean, I would say approximately 20 minutes, but I don't, I don't really know exact timing. Now, when Mr. O'Keefe came back out, uh, did you have any conversation with him? I did. And uh, can I describe that conversation? All right. Is this the instruction that you were talking about instead of the other one? All right, so we'll, jurors, I have another instruction for you. So you're about to hear evidence of statements made by John O'Keefe. Is that accurate now, Ms. Tulelli? Yes. All right. Um, these statements are being admitted only for a limited purpose of establishing John O'Keefe's state of mind. You're not to consider this testimony as proof that the defendant has a bad character or propensity to commit crimes. The testimony of witnesses recounting conversations with Mr. O'Keefe can only be used as they go to the defendant's motive or intent on January 28th or 29th, and only if you find that the defendant was aware of Mr. O'Keefe's state of mind at the time of the crime and would be likely to respond to it. There need not be direct evidence that the defendant learned of Mr. O'Keefe's state of mind, so long as you reasonably can infer from the evidence that she did learn of it. Okay, Mr. Lally. Yes. Yep. Thank you. 
So, Ms. Sullivan, if I could take you back again. So Mr. O'Keefe comes out, you have a conversation with him. Can you describe to the jury what that conversation was about? Uh, I turned around and I was pretty shocked to see him. Um, I said, what's going on? And he said, nothing. I said, did Etta and Karen have words? And he said, I don't know. And I said, um, well, that's not what Etta said. And I asked him if everything was okay. And at that time, his, um, his phone was lighting up and it was, it looked like call texts, calls and texts. And a, and at that time, his, um, his phone was lighting up and it was, it looked like call texts, calls and texts. And it said Karen on his phone. After you make that observation, what did you say to John? I asked him if he needed to take it. And uh, he said, yes, she's crazy. I got to take care of this. And was that the last time that you saw him on New Year's Eve? It is. Now, turning your attention to the following day, New Year's Day, uh, did you see either Mr. O'Keefe or Ms. Reed at all on that day? I did not. I saw the children, um, but, I, but we didn't see them that day, no. Now, turning your attention to the following day, being January 2nd, what was sort of the, the plan as far as um, what was going on that day? Our hotel has a private island. Um, the hotel we stay at has a private island, and we rented all eight of the cabanas between the, the 60 of us that were there. And when the cabanas went on sale, I had reached out to John and, and asked him if he wanted me to get him one. And he said, sure. So I booked one for him and, and he paid me uh, for that cabana. So we all went out that morning um, and it was probably around you know 10 o'clock in the morning and they weren't there yet. And so I, I sent him a text and I said, you know, are, are you coming or do you want me to sell this cabana because there was other, you know, couples there, at least he could have made, you know, the money back. And he asked me who was there. And I said to everybody, um, and I named off, I think I named off a couple names. I'm not really sure, but I said, everybody's here. And when you said that, how did Mr. O'Keefe respond? He said, um, well, apparently I made out with your sister the other night, according to Karen. Now, is that the first time that you had heard that? Yes. So fair to say whatever you had heard from your sister on December 31st was not that. Okay. No, I'll allow that. Correct. And what was your reaction when Mr. O'Keefe told you? Uh, Objection. I'll allow it. I was shocked. I immediately found my sister and said, did you make out with John? Objection. Sustained. Now, when you went to talk to your sister, um, who was it that your sister was with when you went to talk to her about that? I'm not, I don't recall who was, who was standing near her. Maybe my mom. I don't know. Now, as far as your sister was concerned at that time, was she dating someone? Yes. And the person that she was dating, was that person on the trip as well? He was, yes. And was that person that she was dating that was on the trip as well? Were they at you have... I don't know. Now, as far as your sister was concerned at that time, was she dating someone? Yes. And the person that she was dating, was that person on the trip as well? He was, yes. And was that person that she was dating that was on the trip as well? Were they at the commanders on that day that she was dating? They were, yes. Now, as far as um, you have some conversation in regard to your sister... And then at some point, do you go back and have further conversation with Mr. O'Keefe? Yeah, I said, I, uh, um, I texted him back. I said, I just talked to Etta. She said, absolutely not. That did not happen. That's sustained. I'll strike that. Now, at some point after that exchange, uh, did Mr. O'Keefe and or Ms. Reed and or the kids come out uh, to the cabana area? They did, yes. And uh, at any point... Uh, how would you describe sort of how Mr. O'Keefe and or Ms. Reed was acting when they came out to the event? Um, Karen immediately went in the water. I just recall her being like floating in the, the ocean for a, a good chunk of the day. Um, John was hopping around from the different cabanas talking to people. Um, one of my favorite pictures of him is with my son from that day. Did you have any conversation uh, with Mr. O'Keefe once he came out to the commander? Uh, no, we kind of just kept it light. Um, we didn't, we didn't really talk about anything that had happened. Uh, I was just kind of trying to stay out of it for now. And following, uh, sort of the command situation or the, the command of day, um, what happened then? I suppose that day, I think I, I saw John one other time. Um, I saw him in the pool. It was the one time that him and I were alone. He didn't seem like he was himself. Okay. I'll allow it. Um, he seemed distant. And I asked him if he was okay. And he kind of just, you know, shrugged it off. And I said, you know, are, are you happy? And he kind of, you know, just rolled his eyes and shrugged it off. And I said, well, you know, something along the lines of life is too short to not be happy. And he goes, well, you know, Laura, it is what it is. 
And I did ask him if he wanted to talk about it. I said, do you want to talk about it? And he's like, not really. And so following um, that exchange in the, in the pool area, uh, when was the next time that you saw them? I had spoken to him. We, we all went on a, on a Jolly Pirate. Um, we had all bought tickets in advance. So we had basically rented the whole boat for everybody to go. Um, we had bought four tickets and we had gotten a bus from our hotel and he didn't show up for the bus and wasn't answering my calls or my texts. And then uh, we finally got down to where the, the boat was. The boat was about to leave and he messaged me. He's like, not going to make it. Um, kids slept late. And so I didn't think anything of it. And after that, I saw him and Karen uh, the, the night before they left. And they ended up leaving a day or two early so that the kids could get back to school. And when you saw them, where was that in relation to the hotel? Right outside the hotel is a, um, is a marketplace that has a bunch of restaurants and arcade. Uh, I was sitting at the 5 o'clock somewhere bar that looks into the arcade with um, my best friend Val and my friends Dave and Laura and Karen and John walked up. And what, if any, conversation did you have with either of those folks or the defendant at that time? Uh, Karen grabbed me and, and she said, hey, I'm, I'm sorry. I thought I saw something that I didn't. And I would like to pay for some of your sister's room. And how did you respond to that? I said, it's absolutely not necessary. Uh, just an apology will do. And did she persist in wanting to pay for the room? She did. And how so? She just said, I, I, I will apologize, but I, something along the lines of, you know, I, I want to pay for some of her room. Can I just have her room number? I don't remember if I gave her the room number or not. I don't really know. And with regard to that trip, um, when, was the, when was the next time, or when was the last time that you saw it? So um, the, the day that they were leaving, I saw him by the pool. He came up, he gave me a big hug. He said, I love you. This was a great trip. Thank you so much. And I said, well, you're definitely in again for next year. And he said, absolutely. And that was the last time I physically saw him. And so that conversation, just turning back for a moment as far as um, with regard to the street, um, you know what day that would have been as far as in relation to when, when they were leaving? Early January 37th? I want to say it was the 5th. I want to say it was January 5th. Now, after, um, after Ruben, did you have any conversation with Mr. O'Keefe after that? I talked to him via text um, a couple times about a couple different things, but one of them was, um, as I mentioned, we start planning a year in advance, and I said, rooms are coming available. Are you in? And he said, let me, let me recover from this trip first. Now, ma'am, if I could turn your attention to um, Saturday, January 29th, 2022. you recall that day? I do. And um, at some point um, in that morning or during that day, uh, did you get a call? I did. Um, I received a call from... Okay. I'll hear that she received a call from someone. I received a call from my aunt. <laughs> and what did you learn in the call from your aunt? Okay. I won't. That John O'Keefe had passed away. And after you hung up the phone uh, with your aunt, what, what did you do with that? I, okay. I did this subject to second. I called him. I called anybody's number that I had associated with the family. I ended up calling Kaylee. I texted Kaylee. I texted Karen. And uh, without any regard to, to what Kaylee said, did Kaylee respond to you via text? She did. She. And at some point, uh, <coughs> the defendant, Ms. Reed, responded to you as well? She did. Was that a phone call or a text, or how did she respond? It was a text uh, that later that afternoon. And uh, do you recall what she said in the, in the text that you got? Um, she said, hi, Laura. John has passed. And I... Call what, if anything, you responded to that? I, I said, oh, my God, what happened? And she said, we found him in the snow at 5 a.m. And what, if anything, did you ask her or how did you respond? I, I said, what happened? I, I just recall, you know, kind of going into a tailspin, asking a bunch of questions. And, and she mentioned, um, she said, I don't know. We were both at the same party. I didn't go in. I went home. Yes.
Thank you. I have nothing further for this one. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Ms. Hill. Good afternoon. You were not present at the Waterfall Bar and Grill on January 28th of 2022 in Canada? I was not. You were not present at 34 Fairview Road in Canton on January 29th of 2022? It's not. Yet you'll agree with me that Michael Proctor, the state police trooper, visited you at your home in all the way in Pembroke, Massachusetts on February 8th of 2022 yes. to interview you? Yes. Nothing further. Is that anything to know? Uh, just briefly, as far as um, Trooper Proctor coming to your house, was he alone or who, if anyone else was he with when he, he came? Was, he was with another trooper. Okay, do you recall who that trooper was? Uh, trooper Fanning. Nothing further. Your next witness is And uh, how long have you been? Uh, since you're ready. Yeah. All right, Mr. Lally, whenever you're ready. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Could you uh, please state your name and spell your last name? Sure. My name is Marietta Sullivan. Uh, last name is S U L L I V A N. And uh, where do you live? In? Right now, I live in uh, Plymouth. And uh, how long have you lived? Uh, since July. And uh, do you recall sort of the time frame on, on that trip as far as when you were leaving, when you were coming? Yeah. Uh, so we left on uh, Friday the 31st and we returned the next week, Friday the 7th. And when you say we, who is who? My mother and I flew out together with another group of people to meet my uh, sister and brother in law down in Aruba. And uh, after we it was starting around 4 30, so we met everybody. At pool. I ran into uh, Johnny. And you are in that area of the pool? Yes, pool bar. And so when you get down to uh, the pool bar area, um, who, if anyone specifically, did you, did you see or did you run into? So first ran into my sister, gave her a hug, the rest of the kids and my brother. Um, as soon as I got into the pool, I ran into uh, Johnny and um, a couple of our other friends that were um, sitting at the pool bar down there. And with reference to uh, who you referred to as John, uh, what's his last name? John O'Keefe. And uh, that was someone that you knew at the time, is that correct? Yes. And how did you know his name? Um, he was a very, very dear family friend. He was very close to my sister, subsequently became very close to me and, and my family as a result. And he was um, my nephew's godfather. And um, fair to say that you had known him for some substantial period of time? Yeah, since um, Ben's father unfortunately passed away. Um, so at this point in time, when we're talking about turning from 2021 to 2022, how long had you known Mr. O'Keefe about? Oh, man. Um, probably about eight, nine years. It's as long as my nephew's been alive. And when is it that you would see, or how often would you see Mr. O'Keefe? Uh, family parties, any family party that we threw, kids' birthday parties, and um, my sister's Christmas party that she would throw every year. And how would you describe sort of the nature of your relationship uh, with Mr. O'Keefe? Um, he was similar to a big brother to me. He was somebody who was there for my sister during her tar darkest times, so I really respected him for that. Um, but yeah, he was, a, he was a big brother and a family friend. Now, when you saw Mr. O'Keefe at the, at the pool bar after you arrived there, um, what, if any, conversation did you have with him, or what, if anything, were the two of you doing around that? Um, so I went up to him in the pool. He had his Alabama hat on. He expressed to me that he was excited to watch the Alabama football game at the pool bar. Given the circumstances, we were in a beautiful tropical place, and he got to watch his favorite college team uh, play football. Um, and he said that's all he really wanted to do for the day was be able to watch that game. Now, at this point in time um, that you're talking to Mr. O'Keefe, were you aware of him dating anybody? Had you met anybody that he was dating at that time? I had not met the person that he was dating. I had heard about her um, through family, friends, and um, other people that were on the trip. So as far as the other sort of family events uh, that you would see Mr. O'Keefe at, Ms. Reed, uh, or his girlfriend at that time, wasn't, wasn't there with him? No. So after um, the time that you spent at the pool bar that afternoon, um, do you recall what else you did that evening? Yep. So uh, most of us in the group had dinner reservations. Uh, I believe they were around 7 p.m. And we were all getting ready to leave the pool bar to get uh, picked up around 6.30. And as far as a fairly large group that went out to dinner that night? Yeah, most of us. And was Mr. O'Keefe part of that group that went out to dinner? He was not. Um, do you recall about what time it was that you got back to or returned to the hotel? I would, most of us got back a little after nine. Taxis were kind of crazy to get, so a little after nine. And when you got back to the hotel, where did you go? 
Um, I went upstairs to check on my mom. She had gone in a bank of uh, taxis before me. So I went upstairs to make sure that she was uh, up there and safe and in the room. And so however long you spent up in the room with your mother at some point, did you come back? I did. And when you came back down, uh, by down, I mean, do you recall where you were staying in the hotel? Yep. So we were on the fourth floor of the hotel. So I took the elevator up and then I took it back down to the lobby. At that point um, in time, when you're getting back from dinner, going up to the room and coming back down, were you aware of, of where Mr. O'Keefe and, uh, and his niece and nephew were staying? And, yeah, I knew where they were staying, yes, room-wise, yep. And where was that in relation to the lobby? Uh, first floor. Uh, so lobby's on the first floor, their rooms are on the first floor? <coughs> yes. Um, so when the elevator gets down to the... Uh, when the elevator gets down to the uh, lobby level, uh, you get out, is that correct? Mm -hmm. And what if any So you have to sorry. say, okay. <laughs> you just have to answer yes. Yes, sorry. That's okay. Um, so the elevator gets bent down to the lobby, you walk out, who if anyone do you see when you come out? So when the elevator opens up, I the first person I saw was the attendant standing behind the desk. I didn't see anybody else in the lobby with me until I stepped out. Um, when I stepped out, I looked to my left and I saw uh, Johnny coming in through the first set of outside doors. Now, as far as Mr. O'Keefe was concerned, uh, was there any other sort of term that you would use to, to refer to him? Johnny or Godfather. And, uh, Your Honor, I think this may be the appropriate. Uh, all right. So, so folks, that I'm going to say again that first instruction I gave you with the last witness that you're about to hear testimony about certain conduct or behavior allegedly committed by the defendant. Ms. Reed is not charged with committing any crimes other than those charged within the indictment. So this witness's testimony may not and must not. You may not be coming from? Uh, he was coming from the... Uh, so you walk out of the elevator, you're by yourself, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, you see Mr. O'Keefe. Could you see where Mr. O'Keefe was in relation to the lobby or where he was coming from? Uh, he was coming from the outside doors into the lobby. Is that where the pool bar is located? Opposite side. Opposite side. Yes. And when you see him come in, who, if anyone, do you see with him initially? Nobody with him. And uh, what, if anything, was he doing or how was he acting sort of when he came? So he sort of stumbled in. Um, I came out of the elevator and my initial response to him was, whoa, you okay? I actually said, whoa, Godfather, are you okay? Um, but yeah, he uh, was stumbling into the, the lobby. And did you go over to him at that point? I did. I went up to him and I gave him a hug. And um, what happened then? Uh, I pulled back. Uh, he was glassy-eyed looking above me. Um, I, we never made eye contact. He was looking above me. It looked like he was looking for someone. Um, I asked him, where are you going? Assuming that he would be coming to the pool bar to meet us. Uh, he kept looking around and he indicated that he was going that way and pointed toward a bank of rooms to our uh, right. And I said, well, you should go that way. And I stepped back and I guided him toward the area that he was going. Now, as far as the, the bank of rooms to the right, um, you indicated that you were familiar or aware of where Mr. O'Keefe was and where the children were. Is that correct? I know they were on the first floor. I'm not 100% positive as to where exactly their rooms were. Okay. And if you know, did you know whether or not that Mr. O'Keefe was staying in the same room as, as Patrick and Kaylee at that point? I, I didn't know that if they were staying in the same room or not, no. Um, so you point them in that direction, and what happened so I pointed in that direction. He walked off. Uh, I continued out to the pool bar um, when I heard uh, very loudly um, his name screamed across the lobby very angrily, and it made me uh, stop in my tracks. And uh, when you stop in your tracks, what, what happened? Um, I started to turn around to come back in. So once you go out to the pool bar, you kind of go around a corner and you uh, go out of view. So I turned around to go back in. Um, as I'm going back in, I hear um, someone yell, who the fuck was that? And as I come around the corner, I see uh, Mr. O'Keefe walking toward a woman. Um, and they were, and he said, um, excuse me. <clears throat> he said, um, calm down, that's, that's Laura's little sister. And what happened then? Um, when I came back around the corner, I said, after Mr. O'Keefe said, calm down, that's Laura's little sister, I said, hi, nice to meet you. Um, that's when 
uh, Miss Reed's head snapped up, um, and she very loudly told me to go fuck myself across the lobby. And I said, yeah, fuck you too, and walked away. And just uh, to be clear, when you say Miss Reed, uh, this is someone that you became familiar with as the trip went along? Uh, this was my first interaction with her. Um, I had never been fully introduced to her at all. I just had seen her sitting by the side of the pool when I had been talking to Johnny earlier in the day. And uh, the person you know to be Ms. Reed, uh, do you see her in the courtroom today? I do. Could you just describe us where she's seated or an article of clothing that she's wearing? Sure. She's in a black and white checkered blazer. She's two people in from you. Does that record reflect identification? Yes. Thank you. Um, as far as <clears throat> Ms. Reed was concerned, uh, what, if anything, did you observe as far as the defendants beyond the yelling? Uh, what, if anything, did you observe as far as her demeanor or how she was acting at the time that, that this interaction was going on? She was just very loud. Um, she very, you know, energetically screamed for me to go fuck myself. She was waving her hands. Um, Johnny was trying to calm her down. And after I said, um, yeah, fuck you too, I went out to the pool bar, so I didn't see much after that. And could you hear anything as far as when you're walking out to the pool bar, as far as any other conversation between the defendant and Mr. Rose? Not after that first time, no. Uh, you go back to the, or you go out to the pool bar, and with anyone did you talk to? Them? I went straight up to my older sister, Laura, um, who was out to dinner with the couple the night before. And I said, okay. um, I'll, I'll allow this part. Um, I went up to her and I looked at her and I said, um, John O'Keefe's girlfriend. And she looked at me and said, Karen. And I said, yeah, you guys like her? She said, yeah, she's okay. And I said, well, she sucks. Now, following that, um, that particular, at any point in time later in that evening, did you see either Mr. O'Keefe or Ms. Reed later on that evening? I did not see them, no. And when was the next time that you did see I saw them briefly on the 2nd, which was the day that we rented Cabanas on the island. And when you say you briefly saw them, about, can you describe so um, we had all rented the cabanas. Each family had one or they were sharing one. I was sharing one with my family down at the end. We got about halfway through the day and realized that their family cabana was still empty. So I um, saw them about halfway through the day when they did come to the cabana. And I briefly saw um, Miss Reed and Mr. O'Keefe at the pool, the island bar, um, that same day. But there was no conversation. Now, with regard to Mr. O'Keefe and Miss Reed, at some point in time on that day of the cabanas, um, what, if any, conversation did you have with your sister regarding that? So my, okay. I don't know what this is. I'll see, yeah, I'll see you at sidebar quickly. And um, in regard to Mr. establishing his state of mind. Jurors, please be mindful of that second instruction that I gave you regarding um, evidence of statements made by John O'Keefe for the limited purpose of establishing his state of mind. And I will fully give you this instruction again at the end of the case. So but it's the same one that I already gave you. Go ahead, Mr. Lally. Ms. Sullivan, with regard to uh, the day of the commandments, uh, did you have some conversation with your sister Laura in regard to Mr. O'Keefe and Ms. Reed? I did. And what, if anything, did your sister Laura tell you she had learned from Mr. O'Keefe? So my sister pulled me aside from everybody and asked if the night that I got into the altercation with Ms. Reed in the lobby, if I was making out with Mr. O'Keefe. How did you respond? That I absolutely was not. And um, when you say absolutely was not, beyond the fact that it didn't occur, what, why would that not occur? Okay. He was, I'll allow it. He was family. He was my older brother. For all intents and purposes, it just never would have happened between us. And you expressed that to your sister, is that correct? I did, yes. Now, as far as the remainder of the trip was concerned. Um, starting with the defendant, Ms. Reed, what, if any, other interaction did you have with her? None. And as far as uh, Mr. O'Keefe was concerned, what, if any, further interaction did you have with him? Uh, none. That was it. And was that normal or, or as far as Mr. O'Keefe was concerned? Objection. I'll allow it. That, as far as I knew, Johnny, that wasn't normal. He would always come to, up to us, up to our family, try to be around my nephew, um, his godchild. And um, he was always the life of the party and wanted to be around his family and his friends. And following that trip uh, in Aruba, did you see Mr. O'Keefe again? I did not. I have nothing further on. All right, Ms. Giannetti. Thank you, Good afternoon, Ms. Sullivan. Good afternoon. 
Fair to say that you were not at the Waterfall Bar and Grill on January 28th of 2022 in Canton. I was not. You were not at 34 Fairview Road in Canton on January 29th, correct? I was not. Yet Trooper Proctor drove all the way to Pembroke to interview you on February 8th of 2022. Did he not? He did. Nothing further. Mr. Lally, anything? Just very briefly. Um, Ms. Sullivan, when Trooper Proctor came to the house in Pembroke, were you living there at that time? I was. And uh, was he alone or was he with another trooper? He was with another trooper. And uh, do you recall that trooper's name? I don't. Now, with regard to your conversation with Trooper Proctor uh, and the other trooper that day, um, was it just you that he spoke to? Just me. Um, let me ask you a different one. Okay. As far as... When the troopers came to your house on February 8th, are you the only person from your home that the troopers spoke to that day? No. Who, if anyone else, did they speak to at all? They spoke to my sister first. And um, at any point, did they speak to your sister's boyfriend as well? No. And when they spoke to you, and when, when they spoke to you, where was your sister? She was outside of the house. She went to go get, pick up my nephew. And when they spoke to your sister, where were you? I was downstairs in my room, which was in the basement. And could you hear what they were talking about when, when, you, when they were talking to your sister? I could not. Okay. All right, Ms. Sullivan, you're all set. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so jurors, we're actually finished with witnesses for today. We've finished everyone that we had hoped to finish for today. So um, we're done for the day. Um, as you know, we're not in session tomorrow, but we will see you Friday, and Friday will be a full day. So please, those three cautions. All right, guys, that is the end of today's video. And tomorrow will be another full day of trial. Also, it's Friday, and I have a lot of work to do, and I have two video calls with two different clients. So because of that, it's likely I'm going to have to catch a lot of tomorrow on the replay and, you know, later after the actual testimony is done. Like I said, I think tomorrow is Brian Higgins, who was one of the one of the investigating officers, I believe. Okay, and I hope you enjoyed this, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Oh.